Pay close attention to this data. 13.5 million cases and about 600,000 deaths worldwide. While in Europe and Asia, the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic is already more or less under control, the virus continues to spread around the world at breakneck speed. In Latin America, for example, while preparing this video, the pandemic had not yet reached its peak, and already it is producing some massive social and economic havoc. Brazil, for example, forecasts a fall of between 6.4 and 9% of its GDP in 2020, a fall that, if things don't start improving, could get even worse. But of course, the worst factor is no longer the economy, but the number of victims it is leaving in Latin America. To give you an idea, around 3.5 million cases and more than 150,000 deaths have been confirmed in this region so far. This accounts for around a quarter of all cases worldwide and 20% of all fatalities. And if we include the figures from the United States, with more than 3,450,000 cases, the truth is that the American continent already accounts for more than half of all of the cases in the world, despite having just over 13% of the world's population. In fact, if we want to talk about a country that is experiencing the worst of this trend, clearly it is the USA. Look at this chart. Far from controlling the situation, the United States is experiencing a brutal upturn in the first wave. An upturn that continues to break new records. For example, more than 71,000 infections occurred on July 10th. That's 71,000 infections in one single day. And friends, in the land of Uncle Sam, a curious phenomenon is taking place. The pandemic is moving at two different speeds. In states that first suffered the onslaught, such as New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, and Connecticut, the first wave seems to now be under control and stable. It's a scenario that's very similar to what is happening in Europe. However, in states where it was fairly well controlled at first, but where restrictions were generally relaxed much earlier, they are now experiencing wild increases in case numbers and deaths. We're talking about states like Arizona, Florida, Florida, Texas, or even California. Two speeds that mean it's not possible to talk about a second wave yet. Although in some other countries where they suffered the first early blows of the coronavirus, they are already talking about the possibility of a resurgence. Take, for example, the case of South Korea. South Korea says it is battling a second wave of coronavirus. Reuters. Now, considering what is happening in America and comparing it to the apparent calm that Europe seems to be experiencing, and given the concern that is coming from Asia, could we say that we are on the threshold of a second global wave of SARS-CoV-2? Could it be beginning to manifest itself earlier in some parts of the world than in others? And the most important question of all, what would this scenario really entail? Can we avoid it? Well, listen up. Friends, before I start, I'm going to ask you a question. Have you ever wondered what the definition of a second wave really is? Yes, okay, I'm sure we all have some sort of idea, but what exactly is it? While it seems like an easy question, the truth is that there is not even any consensus among experts. A common belief is that the second wave will occur when a very significant and sustained increase in coronavirus cases is recorded over time. An increase that occurs after a relatively long period in which the transmission rate is zero, or at least very low. That is why, strictly in the case of countries like the United States, we cannot say that there is a second wave, since the minimum number of cases recorded after the first peak was just over 18,000 in a single day. In other words, in the United States, they simply have not yet managed to control the effects of the first wave. And that alone should make the authorities, both federal and state, ask themselves some questions. And of course, some constructive criticism would not be a bad thing right now. How is it possible that the world's greatest power is the country that is having the most trouble in controlling this pandemic? Well, at least it looks like Trump's campaign against masks is already history. The point is that today, virtually no country seems to fit the definition of a second wave, at least for now. But wait a moment, why are we talking so much about and giving such great importance to the second wave? Why is it so scary? Well, the main reason is the comparison to the 1918 flu, a flu that in many ways looks a lot like the current coronavirus pandemic. 
And you see, this earlier flu, the H1N1 influenza that became a pandemic, entered the lives of 50 million people and, according to data from confirmed cases, infected more than 500 million. This main similarity is that, like SARS-CoV-2, it was a new virus, highly contagious by the respiratory route and completely unknown to the human organism. That is, people had no defenses to reject the infection. This, as with the coronavirus, caused it to spread rapidly around the world and consequently, fatality rates were very high. Its main peculiarity, the second wave was much more deadly and infected many more people than the first. And it's that particular fact that makes the fear of the second wave of the coronavirus so strong. Will it have the same consequences as in 1918? And the bad news is that the world's leading experts almost assume that the second wave will be a reality. Take a look. A second wave is almost inevitable, particularly as we go towards the winter months. The challenge for government is to ensure that the peak isn't so great that it overburdens the healthcare system. Professor Jonathan Ball, virologist at the University of Nottingham. In my mind, it's inevitable that we'll have a return of the virus. When it does, how we handle it will determine our fate. Dr. Anthony Fauci, director of the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases of the United States. The big question is, how will this new attack of the coronavirus be? Will it be wild and lethal like the 1918 flu? Or could it be something very different? Could that terrible scenario be avoided? Well, let's take a look. A second wave imminent? If we pay attention to the international press, it seems that a second wave would go something like this. A WHO official warns of a second deadly wave of the coronavirus across Europe in the fall. Now is the time for preparation, not celebration. Business Insider. Second more deadly wave of coronavirus expected to hit Europe this winter. The Telegraph. Europe's top World Health Organization official warns that a second spike could coincide with outbreaks of other infectious diseases. The fact that in the face of such alarm, I think there is something that we should ask ourselves. Is there really any grounds to think that a second wave will be so terrible and lethal? Well, on this subject, there are all types of arguments, both good and bad reasons. But let's start with the bad ones. The question of immunity. The main concern for a second wave is that even though coronavirus has turned the world upside down, in practice, very few people have overcome the infection. The vast majority of the world's population remains as exposed and helpless to coronavirus as they were before it was discovered. For example, in the case of Spain, the government's seroprevalence study estimated that only 5.2% of the population have recovered from the infection. And check this out. For data from other countries that have been greatly affected, the numbers have been similar. The Netherlands has around 3%, France just under 5%, and Sweden 6.1%. But the bad news doesn't end there. Even those few people who have been infective and have antibodies might not be as protective as we might think if a second wave were to recur in autumn or winter. The problem? Antibodies may not remain in the body for long enough. Coronavirus antibodies may last only two to three months after infection, study suggests. CNBC. When you look at the history of coronaviruses, the common coronaviruses that cause the common cold, the reports in the literature are that the durability of immunity that's protective ranges from three to six months to almost always less than a year. Anthony Fauci. Or in other words, herd immunity, where the pandemic disappears if between 60 and 80% of people have been exposed to and recover from the virus might not be an option. So faced with this reality, the question is, what can we and the United States do to avoid this dreaded mass second wave? Well, the truth is that that there is no magic bullet here. We need to do what we already know. Until a vaccine is available, all we have left is prevention, protection, and mass testing. But in saying that, we do have reasons for optimism because the truth is that the scenario we're facing now is very different from that between January and March. We now have special precautionary measures in terms of transport and in the arrival of international travellers. We have closer control of suspected cases and a greater ability to conduct screening. We have learnt how to isolate positive cases and their contacts. And in many countries, there is even a detailed tracing and alert system for people who might have been infected by being close to a positive case. In addition, people are much more aware of and conscientious in the use of their masks. And this is very important because even if only half of the population use them frequently, the spread of the virus would be greatly reduced. Take note, because this simple habit, wearing masks, could really be what makes the difference between a resurgence or keeping the virus at bay. Look at these images for a moment. 
Without a mask, respiratory droplets when speaking, breathing, coughing or sneezing can spread from one to seven and a half meters in some cases, thus being able to infect anyone in the near vicinity. However, with a mask, the droplets are trapped inside and do not disperse through the air. So if everyone wore a mask, even if it was a simple surgical mask, then the coronavirus would barely have a chance to cause a second wave, at least not a significant new wave. Take for example what happened recently on a plane traveling from China to Toronto. One of the passengers turned out to be infected with coronavirus and had a dry cough throughout the flight. Well, none of the 25 passengers sitting two meters around were infected because the man with the virus was wearing a mask. Something like this also happened to hairdressers in Springfield, Missouri, USA. Two hairdressers turned out to be infected by SARS-CoV-2, but none of the 140 customers that they had contact with tested positive. And yes, this was also because they had been wearing masks. And this is the conclusion, according to research published in the prestigious scientific journal The Lancet, which gathers data from 172 studies from 16 different countries on the effect of masks, the risk of transmitting the virus is greatly reduced by mask use. Trump may take note. According to the study, an infected person who in fact may be asymptomatic and therefore not know that they are infected has a 17.4% chance of infecting another person if they do not wear a mask. But whilst wearing one, the probability is reduced to 3.1%. And if we combine social distancing, then the probability is further reduced to around 2%. So, on to the big question. Can a second wave be completely avoided? The answer is, unfortunately, no. But if the question were, can a second massive deadly wave be avoided? Then the answer would be yes. Yes, if we all do our bit. So, you know, please wear a mask. It's the least you can do. So at this point, the question is, how might a second wave look if we all complied with hygienic standards and wore a mask? Well, certainly something very different from the second wave of the 1918 flu. Take a look at this. A different future. We mentioned in the beginning of the video, South Korea declared the second wave of the virus in their country on the 22nd of June 2020. However, if you look at the graph of the new daily cases in that country, we see that in reality, it's rare that 50 new cases a day are exceeded. At least, these were the data when preparing the video. But hold on a minute, so why do they already consider it a second wave when there are so few daily cases? Well, this becomes clear when you compare their previous data. In the case of South Korea, they had weeks with virtually zero cases, and then suddenly more and more new outbreaks began to appear. Well, dear friends of visual politic, this is precisely how a second wave could manifest itself in countries like Korea, where virtually everyone wears a mask and where people are hyper aware of the risks posed by this virus. And look, this scenario is still a huge challenge, a challenge for both health and the economy, which we will have to put up with at least until the much desired vaccine appears. A second wave based on small but numerous outbreaks would force such action. Containing outbreaks would require selective quarantines, such as the closure of entire apartment buildings, businesses, and even neighborhoods that may have to spend isolated periods with the corresponding stigma and fear that would arise in those circumstances. It would also take a very thorough system of tracking and tracing cases and possible contacts to quickly put infected individuals in isolation and thus ensure that they do not continue to infect others. Of course, this scenario could also have a strong impact in terms of investment and business. I mean, the effect on the economy might take a long time to Rectify. And that would mean that government should already be taking steps to compensate for these damages. This scenario would infinitely be better than the disaster that we've been seeing since the beginning of the year. Therefore, the number one goal has to be to avoid a second, uncontrolled and large scale wave. And avoiding it is something that is, after all, in the hands of all of us and will come down to our responsibility in terms of hygiene, precautions in avoiding very crowded places and, of course, as we have already described, wearing a mask. Because even if governments have the responsibility of protecting borders to prevent cases from entering from other more affected countries or of conducting many more tests to quickly detect these new outbreaks, the truth is that what happens day to day is largely dependent on all of us. So the big question is, will we be able to do it? Will we be responsible enough? to avoid a second mass wave by continuing to take preventative measures even when we think the worst is over. 
friends, we have the technology, we have the means, and also the experience of the last few months, but will we really be able to achieve it? Let's hope so. Friends, this is the scenario we're facing. The risks and measures to try to slow the virus are already well known to all of us. So I really hope you enjoyed this video. Please hit like if you did, and don't forget to subscribe for brand new videos. Also, this channel is possible because of Patreon and our patrons on that platform. Please consider joining them and supporting our mission of providing independent political coverage. And as always, I'll see you in the next video.